friends and welcome back. Merry Christmas. Today we're celebrating the birth of Jesus in this world. Today we celebrate his entrance into this world. Jesus came to bear the sins of this world on the cross, but he came through the virgin birth. He came humbly as a baby. And the one thing about today is, as we celebrate Christmas, that I want you to be thinking about is the enormity of what Jesus did. John chapter 3, verse 16 says that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Today we celebrate the expression of his love to humanity. When Jesus was born so many years ago, and yes, I recognize we may not have the exact day right, but this is a day that we set aside to celebrate that birth. Whether he was born on the 25th or not, this is a day where we just set apart to celebrate his entrance into this world. It's a day of family, of giving, and I just want you to know that our team is praying for you. We love you, and we're thankful for you. We're, we look back on this previous year, all that God has accomplished through this ministry, the lives that have been touched, your testimonies that you've sent to us. And we're just so thankful for everything he has done. We're thankful for you, our faithful partners, and those who have given, and those who pray for us and enable us to do what we do. And just as a quick recap, as we're closing out this year and celebrating Christmas, we finished over three, you know, we're over 300 broadcasts that we finished now with the program. We released our third book. We we're releasing our fourth. We're, we're targeting January. The message is going out. And I encourage you on this Christmas day, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus by being with our friends and families, just shut down the noise around you. Remember the reason for the season. It's not just so we can get wonderful gifts, but it's to us to celebrate his entrance into the world. Remember, Carolyn, I love you. We pray for you. And as we get started in today's teaching, I had thought about doing a Christmas message, but really feel like the Holy Spirit wants us to continue on talking about our subject, walking in the miraculous. It is because of the birth of Jesus, because of his life and ministry, that we, and because of the cross of Christ, that we are able to walk in the miraculous today. Today, on Christmas Day, we can make a new commitment to him. Why don't you give him a gift today? Why don't you set aside some time away from family, away from the football games, away from the noise, just to be with him? Sit down with him and say, I just want to express my gratitude to you for coming and humbling yourself to enter into this earth as a baby. I want to spend time with you. Friend, I'm not saying you have to spend the whole day or anything like that with him, but what a gift that would be to him, to set aside time just to be with him. You know, in John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus said, this is eternal life that you might know him and the one you sent. Why did he come, you know, as a baby in that manger? Because it took a man, a human being, flesh and blood, to redeem us. It took a human being who would be free from sin. The reason he came through the virgin birth is because the blood flows from the Father. Jesus had to come in the form of a man in order to die in our place. But he came through the virgin birth to be separated from the sinful bloodline that has been passed down to every man and woman since Adam and Eve. And friend, he's calling us to be expressions of the kingdom of God in this earth. 
We finished our last broadcast in James chapter 4, and I encourage you to get your Bible if you do not have it with you. Let's take a look at this and, you know, just kind of let the Holy Spirit lead us today. In James chapter 4, in verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Now, as we're looking at this, again, as I've said before in the previous broadcast, when we talk about humbling ourselves, we're talking about moving into a place of complete dependence on him. This doesn't mean that we, you know, are no earthly good or anything like that, or we are meek and mild and have to let ourselves be run over by things. It is coming to a place of complete and total dependence on him, complete and total dependence on the anointing, complete and total dependence on his supply, on his healing power, on his provision, on him. The person who humbles themselves operates from a position of dependence. Far too many of us in the church today operate independently of him and only go to him when we have a crisis. He wants to be a part of our everyday life. He wants to work with us, walk with us. He wants to have fellowship with us, to communicate with us. But we must acknowledge his presence. We must look to him. And you cannot do that when you are looking to the world. Now, if you move up in James chapter 4, I want you to notice something that he says here. And we'll say in verse 4, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whoso therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The most common way to look at this and talk about this that I've heard over the years is when we talk about becoming a friend of the world, we're talking about living in sin and so on and so forth. But I want you to think about something. I want to ask you to think about something. Could it be more than just living in sin and adultery and drunkenness and all these things that we consider to be awful, you know, lifestyles and things like that, just totally despicable to God? Could it be, when he's talking about that, is that we become a friend of the world when we spend more time with the world than we do with God? As I've said before, friend, and you hear me talk about it a lot, and I know, you know, sometimes it seems like I just am repeating myself on it. It's not a sin necessarily to watch a movie or listen to a broadcast and things like that. But when you take an inventory of your time, where are you spending the majority of your time? How much time do you set aside each day just to spend with him? Just to listen and see what he's interested in. We are far too focused on self in the church today, and I believe that's one reason why we're not seeing the miraculous manifest. I once heard a message by Catherine Coleman where she talked about how much God hates self, how much he hates selfish desires. We talk about self We're talking about living from a place of dependence on you instead of living in a place of dependence on him. Too many people in the church today are dependent upon, you know, their strength, their knowledge, their abilities. We go to college, we learn a career, we might go to tech school or something like that. We practice our trade, we become really good at it. You hear people talk about becoming a self-made man or a self-made woman. When you hear things like that, you're hearing a person who is saying they have become a friend of the world. And yes, there are people within the church that are just as guilty as those outside. As I mentioned In the previous program, in Acts chapter 11, we see the first occurrence 
in Antioch of people calling the followers of Christ Christians. We use that term far too loosely in the church today without really thinking about what we're saying. We're talking about a Christian. We're talking about somebody who walks as he does, who walks in his footsteps. We're talking about a person who's come to complete dependence upon him. It is not necessarily a popular thing for me to say, and I recognize that, but we have a lot of believers in Christ who are not disciples of Christ. You cannot truthfully call yourself a Christian if you are not walking as Christ walked. I talked about in the last program how he told the disciples, go, tell the people the kingdom of God is at hand. And how were the people to know the kingdom of heaven was at hand? Because they were to demonstrate by healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons, raising the dead. These were ways to demonstrate the fact that the kingdom have come. Because all those things he told them to do, healing the sick, casting out devils, raising the dead, were manifestations of the kingdom of darkness. And what Jesus was telling was, my kingdom is superior to the kingdom that's operating in this world. You're to go to tell people that there's a new kingdom in town. You know, the old saying goes, there's a new sheriff in town. And how were they to express that? They were to express it by enforcing the rules of the new kingdom. In the new kingdom, we have a Savior whose body was broken that ours might be made whole. Healing is a forever settled matter in the mind of God. The followers of Christ, the people who call themselves Christ, Christian should be going out declaring that his kingdom has come and then enforcing the rule of that kingdom. I re- I'm thinking about, as I'm talking to you today, the old you know Western movies. I remember growing up, we would watch some of these old Western movies. My dad enjoyed watching you know movies with John Wayne and things like that. And you see the good guy entering into town. There would be all these bad guys and things like that. And the, new, the good guy would be, you know, the guy who brings law and order. He would come, and he would just come in and say, there's a new sheriff in town, and go sit in the sheriff's office and let people live as they will. He would go into town and say, there's a new sheriff in town, and he'd go out, and he'd wrangle up the bad guys. He'd, you know, he'd have the gunfights and things like that, but at the end of the movie, the good guy always came out ahead because he had gone out and he had taken action against the darkness that had encompassed that town. We are not called to go out and say the kingdom of God has come and then just go back to our prayer closets and pray that God would do something to show that his kingdom will come. We're ca- called to walk into the darkness of this world and declare that his kingdom has come. And just like the good guys in those old Western movies, we're to pull out, you know, our our for illustrative purposes, our six shooters. I get this picture in my mind of the good guy pulling out his six shooters, taking the the gun of healing, the gun of deliverance, the gun of raising the dead, the gun that cast out demons, and we're to, to just release and begin to open fire because that's what we're called to do. But have we become friends of the world? Have we set our minds on the things of this world? Is that why we're not walking in the miraculous, friend? Is that why we're not seeing the power of God? Because we're not walking in his authority, because we have not humbled ourselves, because we've not developed a relationship with him? He gave us the power in his name. He sent us forth, but he's not going to enforce the rules. It's just like in those old westerns. When the new sheriff came in town, he, you know, the, he or, would have been empowered under the rules of the law. But you didn't see the government coming in you know, the politicians are the ones who had written the law books coming in to enforce the rules. They had a designated sheriff who was sent in to enforce that rule. Friend, you and I are the designated sheriffs of the kingdom of God. Satan is wearing the black hat in this story. And just like in those old westerns, 
We may have a shootout, but at the end of the day, those who have chosen not to become friends of the world, those who have chosen to humble themselves, those who have chosen to renew their minds with the Word of God and set their minds on things above, will be the ones that will be left standing at the end of this shootout. And it will be Satan who will be run out of town. That's how we enforce the kingdom of God. That's how we demonstrate the kingdom of God. But you are not going to get there if you are going to be living like the world around you. And that's why I talk so much about that, because it's becoming more and more of a revelation in my own heart that we have got to shut things off and we've got to set aside time to be alone with him. At the beginning of the series, I talked about the need for preparation, and I told you preparation time is never wasted time. You are not just going to pray the prayer of salvation, believing in your heart, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and go out and begin enforcing the rules of the kingdom. Yes, in his mercy, there are some people who have done that, and they've seen some healings trickling in here or that because of God's mercy. But don't, re- don't ever forget the fact that Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life preparing for three and a half years of ministry. Of that three and a half years of ministry, he spent a year building a foundation, choosing his disciples, letting the Spirit of God re- lead him. Paul the Apostle wrote more than half of the New Testament. He spent three years in the, in the deserts of Arabia, even though he'd been trained under the best theologians of his day. Coming to a place of complete dependence upon him. It is from that place that we will emerge, just as the, you know, the caterpillar goes into a cocoon. He's, he or she is out of sight. You don't see the caterpillar, you see the cocoon. But if the caterpillar stays in that cocoon for the allotted amount of time, it will emerge as a beautiful butterfly. And what we need to do if we're going to walk in the miraculous frame is we've got to encase ourselves in the cocoon of God's Word, in the cocoon of His presence, allowing Him to transform us. And out of that transformation, we can emerge as expressions of his kingdom in this world. We try to rush out without changing our mindsets, without changing our thinking, and I've talked a lot about that in this series, the need to renew our minds in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Paul talks about that. Because your ability to express the kingdom of God will be directly tied to where your focus is. And that's what James is telling us here. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. He's not pulling any punches there. I'm thinking about right now, at a Bible study was at a couple months ago. Carolyn and I were with this Bible study, and there was a lady before, you know, before the study began talking about, it was after the war with Is, you know, in Israel with Hamas had begun, and she was talking about how depressed she was, how sad she was, how upset she was, because all they were talking about was the war. And every, you know, it was all they were talking about. And the Spirit of God checked me, so I didn't say anything. But all I could think was, so why are you listening to them? Where is your place of dominant focus, friend? There's a lot of noise in this world that's drawing our attention. There's a lot of things we can look at, but should we be looking at them? We're called to be expressions of the kingdom of God. We're called to be, you know, the white, the proverbial white-headed sheriff, just like in those old westerns, going into town and kicking the bad guys out. But we have to know the rules of the kingdom, and those rules are found in the Word of God. Too many people have their focus down here instead of up there. Too many people are governed by their five physical senses instead of being governed by the spirit within. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, it says that we have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead living in our spirits. But how many of us acknowledge him on a daily basis? How many of us recognize that he is with us 24-7? When was the last time you just sat down 
and said, Holy Spirit, what are you interested in talking about? When was the last time you sat, you know, went into the kitchen to prepare breakfast and said, what do you think I should eat today, Holy Spirit? Or when you're getting dressed in the morning, have you ever stopped to ask his opinion? See, what I've found over time is there's a, there are people who seem to receive help from the Holy Spirit all the time. They're constantly talking about things he's led them to do and things he's helped them with. But when you look at their lifestyles, they're looking to him. They're asking for his help. They're inquiring. Are we doing the same? If you want to walk in the miraculous, friend, you're going to have to develop this relationship with the Spirit, and you can't develop a relationship with a person that you're never spending time with. Have we become friends of this world? I would say far too many of us have without even realizing it. And I'm not talking about living in sin, and I'm not talking about living an awful lifestyle, you know, murdering your neighbor and so on and so forth. All these horrible things that we see happening. But just because of where we're focusing our attention, yes, we can show up at church on Sunday morning shouting and yelling and running. But what are we doing when the service ends? How much impact did all that running and shouting and yelling and so on and so forth have on our lives? That's a question each of us need to ask. We go back to Matthew chapter 10 where we started everything and looking at this, and once again, as, we're, as we close out and come to the final few minutes of the program today, Jesus, in verse 5, sent forth his disciples, commanded them, saying, Go into the way of the Gentiles, the nitty city of the Samaritans, and enter ye not. Rather, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received freely give. Friend, in Hebrews chapter 13, we see that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is sending you out. He is sending me out. He is telling us to preach the kingdom, to declare that the kingdom is hand, as God is at hand. We have far too many churches that are dried up and not expressing his power today. They're not obeying his commands. I would even go so far as to say they have become friends of this world because we are, if we're more interested in making our services acceptable, open to all, than we are making them acceptable to him, we have become friends of the world. You have the same spirit dwelling within you if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life. And if you haven't, it's just a matter of believing your heart and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord. In John chapter 20, we see when you make that confession, Lord Jesus, I believe that you went to that cross. I believe that you were crucified, that you were buried, descended into hell, paid the price for my sins, and were resurrected, and I confess you now as Lord. If you say something as simple as that, you are now a believer of Jesus. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And what is Jesus saying to you? He's saying the same thing he told them. Preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you've received my power, freely give it. That's what Jesus is telling you today, friend. That's what he's telling me. Where to go, where to be expressions. But to become an expression of of the kingdom will require times spent alone with him. We are to be led by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God will let us know we're ready. He'll start sending us out little bit by little bit. In Isaiah chapter 28, it talks about precept upon precept, little bit upon little bit. These are not things we grow into overnight. The devil will come and, you know, try to discourage you, try to bring you into condemnation. Don't listen to him. We're going to make mistakes as we move along. The key is that your heart is set like flint to be moving forward. You may pray for a sick person and nothing happens. And people say, well, I don't want to pray for somebody that's sick because what if they don't get healed? Let's flip that question around. 
What if they do get healed? <laughs> but it's precept upon precept, little bit by little bit. We grow into these things. And that's why I said preparation time is not wasted time. We grow into the anointing. We grow into his faith. We grow into his kingdom. There will be a time of development, a time of growth. You're going to make mistakes along the way. We're praying for you. We know that you can do this, friend. But that's really the problem is people are so focused on self and so focused on the mistakes that they just get tripped up and refuse to keep moving forward. Get your eyes off of self. Get your eyes on him. Set aside time each day in the word. Set aside time to fellowship with him and allow him to lead you. You will always find him to be very patient. When you make mistakes, when you trip up, he'll be right there to dust you off and help you get up because that's who he is. Now, in the final minute of this program as we're closing out, once again, I know it's Christmas, and this may be a little bit different message, but it's the message the Holy Spirit wanted us to deliver today. I just want to say from Carol and I both, from the depths of our heart, we pray that you have a Merry Christmas, a blessed time with your families, but don't forget the meaning of this day. It's not all about the meal, the presents. Make it about him. Jesus came to this earth. He was God. In Isaiah chapter 40, it says that he held the span of the universe in his hand. I mean, in his hand, he holds the whole universe. But he chose this, in Philippians we see, he chose to set aside his divinity and humble himself by coming in the form of a human being. He limited himself because he loved us so much, friend. So make this day about him. And as we close out today, I just want to remind you, you can live your life to the fullest, walking by the faith of the Son of God.